Usually talks on Israel-Palestine are uh, attended overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly by people who are sympathetic to the speaker's point of view. And I hope there's more diversity than that today. But I want to encourage everybody uh, to, to feel free to ask questions, but especially people who disagree with what you're about to hear. I welcome your questions. I'm going to speak about my transformation from reflexive loyalty to the state of Israel to advocacy for human rights for all people. Did you guys hear that, what I was saying? Should I begin again? All right. I'm going to speak about my transformation from reflexive loyalty to the state of Israel to advocacy for human rights for all people by resolving the fear, confusion, and prejudice that is so prevalent and that prevents a rational discussion of the Israel-Palestine problem, I believe my transformation contains valuable lessons for all of us. I hope to show how our internal logic, so ingrained within us, affects the way we understand and interpret history, and how this logic captivates us into a world of myth where we are unable, even adamantly unwilling, to notice if our beliefs deprive the world of much needed humanity. I will also clarify arguments which I thought protected my people, the Jewish people, from injustice, but which in fact kept me in bondage to an unexamined belief system. In order to end conflict, we need to take responsibility for our beliefs by finding out if they are grounded in actual events. This requires real objective research, without which we will never recognize our roles in the suffering of others or begin to understand how to alleviate that suffering. We also need to get more in touch with our humanity. This requires self-reflection or inquiry into the beliefs and images we take for granted that form a large part of our personal and collective identity. My experience is that inquiry sets free the natural intelligence of the heart and enables us to understand the problem of Israel and Palestine. Excuse me. Um, yeah, without the bias of our social and cultural conditioning. What I am saying is that we cannot understand this problem with the mind alone. True understanding flows from the heart and has far-reaching consequences. Up until the midpoint of the Second Lebanon War, the war between Hezbollah and Israel in 2006, in the summer of 2006, I believe that the cause of the Israel-Palestine problem was the Arab world's non-acceptance of a Jewish state in its midst. And I believe this non-acceptance resulted from centuries of hatred of Jewish religion and culture. I also saw elements within the Christian world as still harboring the anti-Semitic attitudes that had produced centuries of pogroms in Eastern Europe and probably the cruelest event in mankind's recorded history, the Holocaust. But then, upset with Hezbollah's unprovoked attack, I began a conscientious study of the history of Israel-Palestine. My objective was to separate, as best I could, fact from fiction. Initially, I read Jewish authors only, knowing that otherwise I would suspect bias. The majority of my research came from authors with access to Israeli state, Central Zionist, and Israel Defense Forces archives as well as other Israeli government sources. I examined differing viewpoints and randomly selected assertions made by the authors and looked at the sources they cited to substantiate their assertions. I wanted to make sure that the author was not taking information out of context or misrepresenting the intended meaning of the source quoted. In some cases, the misrepresentation was shameful. My study sparked a personal transformation in which I discovered that the root cause of suffering is not, as regards Israel-Palestine, religion, culture, or land. The root cause is the attachment to a limited identity and to the beliefs and images that emanate from and reinforce this identity. We rarely, if ever, inquire into these beliefs and images. For example, I assumed that much of the world held anti-Semitic views. With such an attitude, I was bound to interpret the ideas and behavior of the other as predisposed to incite or ignore the suffering of my people. All of us are comfortable 
with ideas and behavior that fit within the framework of our identity. Ideas and behavior that fall outside this framework, that originate from the other, are interpreted as possible threats. Fear arises. We look at the world through this filter of fear and unconsciously superimpose enemy images onto the other. We reduce the other to an object, then hide from, disable, or destroy that object in order to restore apparent safety into our lives. Many Jewish people equate Arabs with Nazis and other persecutors. A core belief among Jews, including myself at one time, is that Israel is a shelter from a violent world. When I look back at my life and the prejudices I encountered growing up, as well as the shocking bigotry my people uh, were subjected to for centuries in Europe, I understand how Israel could become a safe haven where Jews could find shelter. What I didn't understand was that this belief had become so much a part of my identity that it had crippled my ability to consider evidence that challenged my beliefs, to look at the world through a broader perspective, and to question Israeli policy that was violently suppressing another people. Hezbollah's attack on Israel terrified me. Coming just three weeks after Hamas's capture of Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit on the Gaza border, it seemed hopeless with so many Arab extremists that Israel and the Jewish people could ever live in peace. Feeling oppressed, I resigned myself to the fact that the Arab world would never rest until Israel was destroyed. Clearly, Israel was a victim. And because I was so identified with Israel, I was a victim too. But I didn't recognize this dynamic within myself, and I had no idea that the source of my victimhood was an illusion, that who I was was inextricably linked with Israel. I really was a victim, but I was victimizing myself. As defenders of Israel, we complain that the world hates us, not so much because of what we do, because what we do is necessary and normal, so we think, but for who we are. As long as we see ourselves as victims, we create the very conditions that confirm for us that we are indeed victims. We build walls to separate ourselves from the other. We dispossess and humiliate the other while looking upon ourselves as more righteous and more entitled. And then when the other resists our assaults on his dignity, we complain that Israel faces an existential danger. Then, under the guise of this danger, we justify even more repressive policies, which brings the world's anger down upon Israel, thereby reinforcing and perpetuating this cycle of victimhood. Such dualistic thinking conceives of a world of us against them. Our emotions, our attitudes towards others, how we interpret events, what we notice and what we don't notice will mirror our worldview and trick us into a false conception of reality. The existential danger we imagine is a projection that stems from the fear of inquiring into our identity through the questioning of our beliefs and images. How many of us have taken the time to investigate this question of identity and indoctrination? It seems to me a very important question. You see, as my anxiety compelled me to search for the facts of Israel-Palestine, I was increasingly forced to reflect back upon myself and upon conflicts in me that I had never before examined. This process became, for a while, more a research into me than into Israel-Palestine. As I began to get in touch with myself, I felt immense sorrow for a people whose cries I had been deaf to. These human beings were suffering profoundly from my ignorance. How could I have been so blind, so unfeeling? At a certain point in the process, the entire edifice of myself could no longer withstand the truth, and everything I was suffering, including enemy images, was relinquished. From a search for facts about Israel-Palestine, I had become involved in something greater, a physics that would not settle for just factual truth. Once the physics reached a critical mass, it became about truth, with a capital T, and through a remarkable moment of purification, 
my sense of duality or separation disappeared, and the I I presume myself to be was transformed. My relinquishment of enemy images was so unexpected that I had to test myself to see if these images were really gone. Among other things, I imagined myself in the place of Nick Berg, the young Jewish man, the young Jewish American, who was beheaded in Iraq in 2004. Especially being a Jew, Berg's murder had horrified me, but the enemy images would not return. Instead, a feeling of equanimity awoke, along with the knowledge that beneath their hatred, even the most bloodthirsty of extremists crave the same right to self-determination as do I. To finally see all people as human is a great, great relief. When this relinquishment occurred, I realized that I was as much Palestinian as Israeli, as much Christian or Muslim as Jew. Compassion replaced fear, and clarity replaced confusion. Compassion is the ability to stand in the shoes of the other and see from all perspectives. Therefore, com clarity accompanies compassion. Compassion and clarity, seeking to understand all behavior, ask why the other behaves as he does. What are the stimuli for his behavior? Have we, in some way, provoked his behavior? Compassion and clarity understand that no behavior occurs in a vacuum, and that each of us is responsible for the suffering in the world, and that each of us contributes to the collective mind of mankind. <clears throat> I want to take a look at one of the most common tactics in the debate over Israel-Palestine, accusations of anti-Semitism. In trying to silence and delegitimize virtually anyone who criticizes Israel, accusers allege that these critics are haters, anti-Semites, or if Jewish, self-hating Jews. It is true that a small percentage of critics are anti-Semites and would like to do to Israel what Israel does to the Palestinian people. But most of these critics simply want Israel to comply with international law. And nearly every Jewish critic I've met believes that by opposing policies that relegate Palestinians to lives of second-class citizenship, that they are rescuing the integrity of their tradition. The majority of these critics are true friends of Israel. A true friend will admonish his friend when he sees him acting irrationally toward his neighbor. These critics are not trying to harm the state of Israel. They are trying to pre prevent the state of Israel from harming Palestinians. They advocate equal rights for all because they know that equal rights lead to peace. If criticism of deliberate violations of international law is anti-Semitic bigotry, what is turning's one, turning one's back on the suffering of millions? And what does this say about the Jewish people? To slur a person's character because they care about human rights and equality or because they admit to behavior others deny is moral blackmail and it debases Judaism. Did David Ben-Gurion, Israel's founding father, suddenly become an anti-Semite when he admitted that Israel had stolen the land from the Palestinians? Was Yitzhak Rabin guilty of anti-Semitism when he lamented that ruling over another people has corrupted us? Like the hysteria over existential dangers, most accusations of anti-Semitism are projections. The actual bigotry resides in the minds of those who are afraid to ask why someone is critical of Israel. Indifferent to the suffering of an entire people, these accusers refuse to take responsibility for their feelings of fear, confusion, and anger, all of which are animated by unexamined beliefs and images within their minds. Instead of doing honest research to refute or confirm the criticism, they scapegoat anyone who challenges these beliefs and images. The only people who've slandered me this way are people who don't know me. People who know me know that I'm not an anti-Semite. One definition of an anti-Semite is someone who stigmatizes Jews, stigmatizes Jews who believe in equal rights for all people, not some people. Anti-Semites incite anti-Semitism. 
I don't know anyone who does that more effectively than the Israeli government and its supporters. And by the way, holding Israel to normative standards of conduct is not a form of bigotry. It is Israel with its inhumane policies and behavior that delegitimizes itself. Excuse me for a minute. Now I'd like to clarify some of the common arguments that are used to defend Israeli behavior. Number one, by launching rockets into Israel from Gaza, Palestinians are responsible for the hostilities. Well, I certainly don't recommend rock, uh, launching rockets from Gaza into Israel. However, according to the Israeli Intelligence and Terrorism Information Center, in the nine years ending December 31st, 2008, Palestinian groups launched a total of 8,088 mostly homemade rockets and mortars into southern Israel. In just nine months, from September 2005 to June 2006, Israel fired nearly, nearly 8,000, many times more destructive rockets and mortars into Gaza. The center also acknowledged that Hamas had honored its ceasefire agreement with Israel, which Israel violated on November 4, 2008, with an attack that killed six Gazan policemen, instigating Operation Cast Lead. Israel's primary purpose in breaking the truce was to collectively punish Gaza's residents for voting for Hamas in the 2006 democratic elections and to destroy Hamas for refusing to collaborate with policies that dispossess their own people. Regarding truces, a statistical analysis by Harvard, MIT, and Tel Aviv University found that, quote, 79% of conflict pauses were interrupted when Israel killed a Palestinian, while only 8% were interrupted by Palestinian attacks. The remaining 13% were interrupted by both sides on the same day. And that of the 25 periods of nonviolence lasting longer than a week, Israel unilaterally interrupted 24, and it unilaterally interrupted 100% of the 14 periods of nonviolence lasting longer than nine days, end of quote. The second uh, argument, the Hamas charter calls for Israel's destruction. This is true. So did the PLO charter. And at one time, Egypt routinely called for Israel's destruction. It is also true that Hamas has repeatedly stated that it would accept a peace based on the 1967 borders and would honor the will of the Palestinian people. Hamas has also offered on a number of occasions long-term truces which Israeli analysts believed were authentic. But as with Israel's rejection of Syrian and Egyptian peace officers beginning as early as 1948, Israel has repeatedly ignored Hamas. In any case, this argument is really another projection. From its founding, Israel has always wanted to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians any way they could get away with. And there are many Israeli religious and secular leaders who make no bones about their contempt for Palestinian life, even of infants. Yitzhak Rabin said, and I quote, you don't make peace with friends, you make it with very unsavory enemies, end of quote. The next argument, the Palestinians must recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Benjamin Netanyahu has recently been making this demand, knowing it is another obstacle to peace. He also knows that recognition of Israel as a Jewish state would legalize Israel's discrimination toward its non-Jewish neighbors. It would validate the Zionist pseudo-historical narrative while invalidating the Palestinian narrative, and it would nullify the Palestinian right of return to their homes and villages. Neither the Egyptian nor the Jordanian peace accords were conditioned upon those countries' recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. Argument number four, the Palestinians rejected the 1947 partition plan, UN Resolution 181. Morally compromised for failing to obtain the consent of the indigenous people, Resolution 181 gave 56% of British mandate Palestine to the Jewish people who owned less than 7% of the land and 43% to the Palestinians, with the remaining 1%, Jerusalem and Bethlehem, under the authority of the United Nations. The argument is that Jewish acceptance and Palestinian rejection of partition 
proves the Jewish side has always wanted peace and the Palestinian side has never wanted peace. Therefore, the Palestinians are to blame for this never-ending problem. One of the assumptions of this argument is that Israel would have been content to exist on 56% of Palestine with a divided Jerusalem. But Israel has never been content existing on the 78% of Palestine it has controlled since 1949. For many years, international law and virtually every nation have agreed that a two-state solution should be based on the 1967 borders. Since 2002, the entire Arab and Muslim worlds have, have, through the Saudi Peace Initiative, offered Israel full diplomatic relations and security guarantees in return for a peace based on these borders. Israel has ignored all of this. A Jewish state based upon Resolution 181 would have had an initial 49% Arab minority that would quickly have become a majority. It is utterly naive to think that Israel would have accepted such an outcome. In fact, Ben-Gurion pledged to his political party that the borders established by 181 were not final. In other words, acceptance of 181 partition was a tactical decision and prelude to further expansion. This argument really is nothing more than an attempt to make excuses for the Israeli occupation and the suffering it has caused. Argument number five. The hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who fled their homes in 1948 were instructed to do so by the region's Arab leaders. Therefore, Israel is not responsible for the Palestinian refugee problem. This is flat out false. In 1959, Professor Walid Khalidi proved the claim to be a fabrication. His findings were independently corroborated two years later by Irish scholar and UN diplomat Erskine Childers. By examining the archives of Arab governments and newspapers and the reports of the CIA and BBC, which monitored every Arab radio broadcast in 1948, both men demonstrated that no such instruction had been given. To the contrary, Arab broadcasts appealed to people not to leave their homes. When asked by the United Nations to account for this claim, Israel could not produce a single iota of evidence. Do you see the flaw in this argument? It implies that if Arab leaders had not instructed Palestinians to leave their homes, the Jewish army would have allowed them to stay. If that had been the case, there would have been far more Palestinians in Israel than Jews, spoiling the Zionist dream of a Jewish state. Argument number six. According to the Torah, God gave the land to the Jewish people who are the chosen. Former Prime Minister Golda Meir once said, and I quote, this country exists as the fulfillment of a promise made by God himself. It would be ridiculous to ask it to account for its legitimacy, end of quote. Israel has never defined its national borders. However, its de facto borders adapt to the movement of Jewish settlers and the expansion of Jewish settlements in the West Bank. Jewish residents of the West Bank have full rights of citizenship, while Palestinian residents have virtually none. As most of us know, these rights are founded not on the place of one's birth, like they are in the United States and other countries, but on one's religious affiliation. Israel, however, is a signatory to the Fourth Geneva Convention, which, by the way, was adopted in 1949 in response to Nazi atrocities, and which explicitly prohibits an occupying power from transferring parts of its own population into the territories it occupies. Apparently, God's promise to the Jewish people supersedes the Jewish people's promise to the international community. But if the Torah is so authoritative, shouldn't all who rely on God's promise honor the Torah's prohibitions against scheming, stealing, and breaking contracts? And what, according to Judaism, are the Jewish people chosen for? Are they chosen to steal, scheme, break contracts, and oppress the indigenous people of the land? Or are they chosen, as Jewish mystical teachings say, to repair and bring blessing to the world and to rectify injustice? According to Jewish teachings, this is how the world is made into a dwelling place for the divine. Argument number seven, the last argument I'm going to mention. 
Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. How many times have we heard that? Try telling non-Jews anywhere in Israel-Palestine that they live in a democracy. The purpose of this argument really is to divert attention from Israel's undemocratic policies by professing its moral superiority and ignoring, with regard to its treatment of non-Jews, its moral inferiority. Any definition of Israel's political structure cannot magically disguise the inequality that is made possible by the very people who make this argument. Of the many things that can be said, let me say that within Israel proper, 1,200 Jewish towns have been established since 1948, but not a single Palestinian town. And Israel plans under the Prower Plan to displace tens of thousands of, Palestinian, of Bedouins from their villages within Israel proper. Why? Because they are not Jewish. Almost all of them are Israeli citizens and their villages predate the state of Israel. I hope you can see that each of the arguments I've just outlined, though used by Israel's defenders, actually demonstrate Israel's culpability for the problems we see today. Truthfully, I have not met a single defender of Israeli policy who has impartially studied the actual history. If they had the decency to do so, most would discover that they have character assassinated the Palestinians and facilitated their misfortune. The real conflict for these defenders is not Israel versus a hostile world or Israel versus the Palestinians. The real conflict is the unwillingness to integrate the hard to believe but inescapable awareness of Israel's treatment of non-Jews with unquestioned loyalty to the Jewish state one consideration recognizes Israel's dark side. The other denies the dark side exists. One of the insights that followed my transformation, which really astonished me at the time, was that criticism of Israel had never been a serious concern for me. Incredibly, I had never defended Israel, at least the Israel that actually exists. I had defended an idealistic image of Israel, that was projected or superimposed upon the Israel that actually exists. This projection enabled me to repress or deny painful revelations about Israel and about myself that I would have learned if only I had looked without the influence of an unexamined mind. Denial and projection go hand in hand. What I denied about Israel and about myself, I projected onto the other. My reaction to criticism came more from the fear of taking on the challenge the criticism posed to my identity than from genuine disagreement. I clearly remember that for a split second, just a split second, when someone would defend the Palestinians and criticize Israel, I could sense that there was some truth to what they were saying. But I was afraid to come face to face with my lack of humanity. My self-image would not permit it. I was also lazy. It is easy to have an enemy. It is much harder to do research and discover that others are human beings too. So I ignored document, documented evidence, thereby consenting to the subjugation of an entire people. I judged Palestinian violence as a pathological expression of hatred, not the response of an oppressed people, a small minority of whom resort to violence as the only way they know to retain a measure of self-respect in the face of generations of violence inflicted upon them. I wanted Israel to be secure from violence, but couldn't see that stealing a people's land and replacing one population with another only guarantees more violence. And maintaining this inhumane circumstance requires ever more repression, which the oppressor calls security. This is the type of logic that is the definition of paranoia, and it cannot possibly lead to peace. Occasionally when I speak, someone accuses me of one-sidedness against Israel. Think about it. In my speech, I share the main arguments made by them, made by Israel's defenders. How is that one-sided? Is it my fault that some of these arguments happen to be fabrication, while others, when looked at in detail, are morally bankrupt? In essence, I am accused of being one-sided for exposing their one-sidedness. 
Whenever we are in denial about reality, reality itself will appear one-sided. Furthermore, in order for anyone to know if I am one-sided or not, they have to have objectively and thoroughly researched the subject. That is what I have done for many years, and I am confident that most of the problems we see are a result of Israel's actions. I've talked about how we create our own reality and how daunting it can seem to confront our indoctrination. My commitment to discover the facts is what led me to overcome my indoctrination. That same commitment is available to everyone here. In fact, I don't want you to believe outright anything I've said today. Do your own research and find out, and find out the facts for yourself. If you do, I think you will discover, like I did, some of the deeper things I've talked about. For the record, I am no more pro-Palestinian than I am anti-Israeli. I am pro-equality and anti-oppression. That is why I criticize Israel and advocate an end to its undemocratic policies. If the roles of Palestinians and Israelis were, re were reversed, I would be doing very much the same as what I am doing today. I'd like to close by reading two small par paragraphs from my book. The first paragraph, quote, Tshuva is one of Judaism's fundamental principles. It means repentance and denotes a journey through personal darkness to the light of understanding. Its actualization depends upon transformation. What then is the essence of transformation if it is not about releasing our conditioning and returning to our natural state of compassion and non-separateness? End of quote. The last quote. As long as we see the world in terms of us against them, we will have no choice but to identify ourselves as victims or aggressors in the constant stress of battle, disconnected from our hearts, living in fear. There can be no present, only the agonizing past, as if calamity and misfortune are realities in every moment. In that traumatized vision, we must be prepared to unleash our own holocaust upon others so that, so that it can never again be unleashed upon us. The Jewish people and all people can only be healed when the Palestinian people and all people are healed. Thank you. Gary Anderson, a member of this congregation, and this is First Universalist Church in Edelstead. Uh, and to me, although theologically universalism meant something else, but to me, universalism means is the antidote to exceptionalism. And American except, you know, people who are our kind of people have set special rules, and you know, universal universal application of gravity is the same everywhere. The, the law should be the same everywhere. And now you, you mentioned, uh, Richard, you mentioned that the widely mentioned observation about the Hamas charter says uh, there shall be no Israeli Jewish state. Um, that was 1980, it was quite harsh. The more recent ones are moderated some. Uh, but for the last recent generations, the dominant political party in Israel is Likud. The Likud charter is a mirror of that. The Likud charter says there should be no Arab state between the Mediterranean and then the Jordan River. Right. So anytime somebody says that you know there are Israeli parties who are obstructive to the other side, say yes and right. and so they're, they're again that, that duality, that other, the self and other is the same thing. Exactly. Yes, everything is a projection. The unexamined mind is always projecting its content onto the other and then blaming the other for its own content. So, you know, I mean, you know, and in Israel, I mean, there are soccer matches where stadiums are filled with people chanting death to the Arabs. I mean, there was just, I just read recently there was a rally, uh, one of the Orthodox rabbis in Israel held a rally where over 10,000 young people came in which their, um, the rally partially had to do with rejecting uh, John Kerry's peace uh, initiative, but it was really more about hatred toward the Palestinian people. It's just really terrible what's going on over there. Uh, we all know what APAC is about here in, in our country. Uh, there's another organization uh, which I've been promoting just because it's a, sort of an antidote to it, and that is J Street. But I understand some people say that J Street really believes exactly what APAC believes, and I was wondering what you would think. 
Um, J Street is definitely a Zionist organization. I mean, they, they, from what I can glean, and I've been to their conference, I've read some of their stuff, um, you know, they're very friendly with many Israeli officials. They want a, th their slogan is pro-Israel, pro-peace. They want a two-state solution. They would not accept a single state, a single democratic state. And a two-state solution that they would want would still be an apartheid-like state because it would still be a Jewish state that would discriminate against the Arab citizens. And think about it. Right now, really, it's about 25% of the population of, of Israel proper is, non, is Arab. Actually, I think even more than that is non-Jewish. But the birth rates are so different that in about 30 years, based on the current birth rate, the Arab population would equal or exceed the Jewish population. Now, Israel, as, it's, as it is constituted today, is never going to allow that to happen. So a J Street type of solution would guarantee that ethnic cleansing would have to be uh, uh, perpetrated at least occasionally to make sure that the Jewish population, the democracy problem that J Street even talks about, uh, would, would, you know, would not become a problem. Uh, I believe that Israel has set a standard many, many decades ago. They, just, they set a standard where I believe the, I, I'm not exactly positive about this number, but I believe their number was something like 77% had to be Jewish. Okay, so, you know, I mean, I'm glad J Street exists because they uh, bring more attention to the problem, but in a, in, to a large extent, J Street is a organization that offers absolution to Jewish people who feel guilty about what Israel is doing in their name, but they're not able to go f all the way to just say, look, this is just a bad ideology, there should be no exceptionalism, Zionism, maybe at one time it did have a purpose to protect the Jewish people, but today it is unnecessary. Okay? Um. Yeah, um, I uh, was born and raised in Iran, and um, I have to establish that before um, I tell you the story. Um, I substitute in different schools, you know, Cherry Creek and DPS. So one day when I went to uh, Cherry Creek and I was uh, substituting there, there was a gentleman who decided, you know, he, he was, um, the teacher said, don't do anything. We have a presentation by a gentleman. And the gentleman worked for Cherry Creek District as a technology person. So he was showing, started showing of all the stuff about Israelis and Palestinians and why um, Israel has a right to be over there and, you know, how uh, they got the land for most of the time. They purchased those lands, you know, so um, they own those things and they have... And they given, purchased less than 7% of yeah. the land. And they say, they said many things, but it, it was his lucky day because here I am from that part of the world, <laughs> you know, <laughs> over there. And, um, and then he started talking about Al-Qaeda and all these um, terrorist organizations. And I said, well, it's Al-Qaeda and it's... Um, Zionist and Zionist, Christian Zionists, they are all terrorist organizations and also the Hezbollah of Iran because I wanted to put all of those. So, is that, is that a question? No, I want to just share this story with everybody oh, okay. to know that, you know, what they do in school as far as brainwashing, you know, this student. And then suddenly he said, I'm a Zionist, I'm not terrorist. I said, I beg you differ. You know, they are, you know, you are a terrorist and, you know, anybody who has such a you know, strong, fundamental, you know, right. views right. that is considered that. Use, people use language to, uh, like for example, if you're Palestinian, you're automatically considered a terrorist. Uh, you know, in Israel, the members of the Irgun and Stern gang were considered freedom fighters, but to the people who were murdered by them and their families, they were not freedom fighters. They were terrorists who actually pioneered some of the techniques of modern terrorism. So Israel does terrorize the Palestinians on a daily basis, by the way. And the root cause is the attachment to a limited identity and to the beliefs and images that emanate from and reinforce this identity. We rarely, if ever, inquire into these beliefs and images. For example, I assumed that much of the world held anti-Semitic views. With such an attitude, I was bound to interpret the ideas and behavior of the other as predisposed to incite or ignore the suffering of my people. All of us are comfortable 
with ideas and behavior that fit within the framework of our identity. Ideas and behavior that fall outside this framework, that originate from the other, are interpreted as possible threats. Fear arises. We look at the world through this filter of fear and unconsciously superimpose enemy images onto the other. We reduce the other to an object, then hide from, disable, or destroy that object in order to restore apparent safety into our lives. Many Jewish people equate Arabs with Nazis and other persecutors. A core belief among Jews, including myself at one time, is that Israel is a shelter from a violent world. When I look back at my life and the prejudices I encountered growing up, as well as the shocking bigotry my people uh, were subjected to for centuries, usually talks on Israel-Palestine are uh, attended overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly by people who are sympathetic to the speaker's point of view. And I hope there's more diversity than that today, but I want to encourage everybody uh, to, to feel free to ask questions, but especially people who disagree with what you're about to hear. I welcome your questions. I'm going to speak about my transformation from reflexive loyalty to the state of Israel to advocacy for human rights for all people. Did you guys hear that? What I was saying? Should I begin again? All right. I'm going to speak about my transformation from reflexive loyalty to the state of Israel to advocacy for human rights for all people by resolving the fear, confusion, and prejudice that is so prevalent and that prevents a rational discussion of the Israel-Palestine problem. I believe my transformation contains valuable lessons for all of us. I hope to show how our internal logic, so ingrained within us, affects the way we understand and interpret history, and how this logic captivates us into a world of myth where we are unable, even adamantly unwilling, to notice if our beliefs deprive the world of much needed humanity. I will also clarify arguments which I thought protected my people, the Jewish people from countries in Europe. I understand how Israel could become a safe haven where Jews could find shelter. What I didn't understand was that this belief had become so much a part of my identity that it had crippled my ability to consider evidence that challenged my beliefs, to look at the world through a broader perspective, and to question Israeli policy that was violently suppressing another people. Hezbollah's attack on Israel terrified me. Coming just three weeks after Hamas's capture of Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit on the Gaza border, it seemed hopeless with so many Arab extremists that Israel and the Jewish people could ever live in peace. Feeling oppressed, I resigned myself to the fact that the Arab world would never rest until Israel was destroyed. Clearly, Israel was a victim. And because I was so identified with Israel, I was a victim too. But I didn't recognize this dynamic within myself. And I had no idea that the source of my victimhood was an illusion, that who I was was inextricably linked with Israel. I really was a victim, but I was victimizing myself. As defenders of Israel, we complain that the world hates us. Not so much because of what we do, because what we do is necessary and normal, so we think, but for who we are, injustice, but which in fact kept me in bondage to an unexamined belief system. In order to end conflict, we need to take responsibility for our beliefs by finding out if they are grounded in actual events. This requires real objective research without which we will never recognize our roles in the suffering of others or begin to understand how to alleviate that suffering. We also need to get more in touch with our humanity. This requires self-reflection or inquiry into the beliefs and images we take for granted that form a large part of our personal and collective identity. My experience is that inquiry sets free the natural intelligence of the heart and enables us to understand the problem of Israel and Palestine. Oh, excuse me. Um, yeah, without the bias of our social and cu cultural conditioning. What I am saying is that we cannot understand this problem with the mind alone. 
true understanding flows from the heart and has far-reaching consequences. Up until the midpoint of the Second Lebanon War, the war between Hezbollah and Israel in 2006, in the summer of 2006, I believe that the cause of the Israel-Palestine problem was the Arab world's non-acceptance of a Jewish state in its midst. And I believe this non-acceptance resulted from centuries of hatred of Jewish religion and culture. I also saw elements within the Christian world as still harboring the anti-Semitic attitudes that had produced centuries of pogroms in Eastern Europe and probably the cruelest event in mankind's recorded history, the Holocaust. But then, upset with Hezbollah's unprovoked attack, I began a conscientious study of the history of Israel-Palestine. My objective was to separate, as best I could, fact from fiction. Initially, I read Jewish authors only, knowing that otherwise I would suspect bias. The majority of my research came from authors with access to Israeli state, Central Zionist, and Israel Defense Forces archives as well as other Israeli government sources. I examined differing viewpoints and randomly selected assertions made by the authors and looked at the sources they cited to substantiate their assertions. I wanted to make sure that the author was not taking information out of context or misrepresenting the intended meaning of the source quoted. In some cases, the misrepresentation was shameful. My study sparked a personal transformation in which I discovered that the root cause of suffering is not, as regards Israel-Palestine, religion, culture, or land.